Happy 2020. Jesus Christ. Happy 2024, everybody. Well, it is the beginning of the new year, which means that it is time for every film reviewer on YouTube to release their top and bottom 10 films of 2023 onto the world. I am doing the same a little bit late just to kind of get in those last couple movies I'm missing, just in case they, you know, make an impact somewhere. I hope everyone is not bored by top 10 lists by the time I make these things. Besides that, a couple updates from last year's video, which was my first top 10 video ever. I did not have a bottom 10 last year because I probably just didn't feel like it was necessary or I just wanted to kind of stick to being more positive, but that time is over. I want that monetization, so I'm going to be a little negative Nancy. The video last year did feel too long. I mean, at 33 minutes. I mean, who's gonna listen to my voice for 33 minutes? So I've decided that I'm going to turn this thing into kind of like a trilogy. The idea will be that there will be a worst of list, a list of recommendations, and then a top 10 films video. The last two, which will come out hopefully soon after this video comes out. We'll see. I'll also probably get more into like spoiler stuff that I didn't want to talk about in the reviews. Another thing, if you can't tell already, I'm going to be much more loose in my speaking when it comes to these videos. And I'm going to use a lot more hyperbole. I'm going to talk annoying, basically. I'm going to talk like every other reviewer on YouTube currently. All right, so we're going to now get into the worst films, in my opinion, of 2023. So at number 10, we have The Last Voyage of the Demeter. I did a review on this, so you can see my disappointment in full in that video. Funny enough, the other option that we were weighing to go see turned out to be my worst film of 2023. At least the money did go to something I would rather support a film with actors that I liked and a director who I think is having a lull when it comes to this film. Honestly, if we went and saw the other movie in theaters, we would have just left the theater and probably asked for a refund. We're going to get into the reasons why for that. You'll see. Stay tuned. I don't think I brought this up in the review. There was this really weird thing with how the boat can transfer the sound of you knocking on it from one end to the other. I don't know. That was just bad screenwriting in my opinion. I found that concept to just be a means to an end and it didn't settle itself into the world of the film or the logic of the film or anything like that at all. One of the things that frustrated me the most about Last Voyage of the Demeter was the very ending of the film which had a very superhero-esque ending of one of the survivors of the boat becoming a a, a vampire hunter of some sort. I can't remember if it ends with him seeing Nosferatu just standing somewhere and then the music got like a little bassier and a little drummier and then he says like, I'm going out hunting or something and it was just marvelized. I'm still shocked that two actors who I've seen give like really phenomenal performances. I cannot remember her name right now and I remember it being very difficult to say her name. I'm gonna take it from the review and just say, from the Nightingale and Woody Norman from Come On, Come On, just having to perform the screenplay must have been a giant pain in the ass for them, but at least they got paid. At number nine is No One Will Save You. Again, did a review. I'm pretty sure in the review I talked about how the film had a very good advertisement, a very good trailer, and I realized when I was watching it that it's because they only showed the one good scene in the movie, which is the initial invasion scene, which I'd say about halfway through becomes very annoying. There seems to be something about modern aliens in movies where they are just given too many character traits or something to kind of give some sort of half-assed biology lesson on these things. And basically it's the writer trying too hard to make his alien interesting. The no talking gimmick has only gotten worse in my memory. It's shocking to me how just poorly handled that was. It just have them talk, just have the person talk to themselves. Also, I guess since this is a spoiler video, I found the big reveal to uh, make the main character so unlikable, it made me not care even more about the finale, because why would I want someone who clearly is a murderer getting any kind of deus ex machina half-assed retribution? I just found it extremely frustrating that you couldn't have just made it an accident, could you? You had to, for some reason, make her a vicious child murderer. It's bizarre. And number eight is God's Time. It's a independent film that was shot in New York. I remember seeing the trailer for it at IFC and it somewhat intrigued me, but I could also see kind of the rough edges of like the micro budget indie kind of feel. I found the cinematography to be very nice looking. They had a good DP on this movie. I thought the acting was, you know, fine, but the characters, I couldn't relate to them, not because they were, you know, ex-drug addicts or anything like that, but overall their characters kind of felt like optimistic Greg Araki characters with the dullest edges. The nihilism's just gone. That's what makes 
Greg Araki movies so good is the fact that our characters are borderline annoyingly nihilist. The dialogue is made funnier because of their dark dispositions. Overall, I don't feel like the characters, their journey really deviated from any other kind of independent travel across the city to accomplish a goal characters that I've seen in other independent films set in New York. Overall, forgettable film good stepping stone movie, I'd say. Hopefully these guys come back with something a little stronger, a little more interesting, something that will keep your attention for longer than whatever this movie did. At number seven is Fool's Paradise. This is Charlie Day's directorial debut. And to be honest, I wanted to like this movie. I will say that Charlie Day does a good silent performance. You know, it was a very funny Charlie Chaplin impression, basically. I think one of the most annoying things about Fool's Paradise is that there is a great story in that script, but its satire was basically castrated by Charlie Day, who I think had been probably treated quite well by crews at this time, and while making the film, didn't want to make anyone too mad, so all the characters just became these harmless caricatures who will just say, like, shocking things at the most consumable level, if that makes sense. This film is a punch pulled so far back, the fist doesn't even move. I think if Charlie Day wrote the script back in the early, early seasons of It's Always Sunny Time and somehow was able to get it made, we would actually really have a good story here, probably one that would be full of bite and venom, which is just sorely missing from this film. The easiest group of people to make fun of, to create a satire about, to be unrelentingly brutal towards, to me is a Hollywood production lot. And the fact that he thought he could get away with being as nice as possible to every character character in this film was very frustrating. At number six is You People. I did a review of it. To me, 2023 seems to be the year of actors who just used to have some venom in their teeth and rolled onto their stomachs in submission to the concept of just making money and not having a voice anymore. Last year was kind of a Eddie Murphy revival for me. I watched a lot of his movies that I hadn't seen before. One of them was Beverly Hills Cop, and I still remember Eddie Murphy's rant in the hotel where he's calling the staff racist and like drops a hard R right at the end of it, and it was so funny. And this film wants to be that scene, and it just failed. At number five is Bama Rush the much lauded HBO documentary. We've all gone through it already. No one liked it. It has extremely low scores on both IMDb and Letterboxd. The shame is that this could have been a great documentary about antiquated college traditions that keep toxic attributes of racism and repressive traditionalism alive, all that. But instead, this film ended up being directed by a woman who was obviously bitter about never being able to participate in these nightmarish traditions and also really, really needed to tell us about her alopecia. The thing is edited like a YouTube video. The opening five minutes with that Instagram scrolling montage was just a really bad start. If a more humble filmmaker was at the helm of this movie, they would have done the right thing and they would have turned the cameras off and they would have sent everyone home when it became very clear that there was no possible way for the filmmakers to infiltrate the Alabama rush week and we wouldn't have had to watch this thing. That would have been the better outcome. At number four, we have The Pope's Exorcist. To be upfront, I turned this movie off after 40 minutes and I'm going to explain why. The reason was 40 minutes into this movie the film had exhibited no original possession horror ideas it had not exhibited any original horror ideas it had not exhibited any original ideas period we have a random family with a bitchy daughter and a traumatized son and a stressed out mom moving into a, some creepy house they could never afford there are bumps of the night the movie begins with russell crowe fighting a demon out of a child that's swearing at him and at that point all these things had happened and and I was done. It was clear that this film was not interested in doing anything worth my time, so I turned it off. If you do not exhibit one original idea or a fresh take on something done before, you have absolutely no right to waste my time. 
And that is what I said to the Pope's exorcist as I backed out of whatever app I was watching it on, and I went and I found something better to watch. What a waste of a film. What a just annoying movie. It shocks me when screenplays that are so dull and lifeless, somehow someone decides to put millions of dollars in that script. Speaking of shocking scripts, number three is Genie, the Melissa McCarthy vehicle that came out sometime late last year. This film was written by Richard Curtis, who has clearly run out of inspiration or energy to put into writing a good film. This is a borderline conflictless film. Even though there is conflict present, there is a man who is fighting for his family. At no time did this conflict feel pressing. Like this guy just had all the time in the world to fix everything around him. And it wasn't like a problem that Christmas was on its way. It was Christmas time in the movie because the movie was gonna be released on Christmas. It was a business decision. It was not a creative decision. I do think Melissa McCarthy is funny and she did legitimately make me laugh multiple times in this movie. I'll give the movie that, I laughed. But it is sanitized and it is padded to the point of it being insulting. To be this just empty of anything but the most accessible, sugary, sweet humor. It's boring, is what it is. At number two of the worst films of 2023 is a little passion project, one would call it. I am, of course, talking about 80 for Brady. 80 for Brady was produced by a narcissist, also known as Tom Brady. I know that there were real ladies who were fans, but the fact that the person they were fans of had a part in the creative decisions of this film is, to me, borderline unethical. And I watch shit like Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS, and in terms of ethics, they're both going in around the same category. It's the, should you have done that category? Where with Ilsa, it's like, oh, should we be making an exploitation film about the Holocaust, 80 for Brady is, should the man whose name is in the movie be someone who has creative input as a producer? Every sports player was obviously reading cue cards and waiting for their checks. There was a scene, I remember, near the end of the film where Tom Brady is inexplicably listening to Lily Tomlin give him a pep talk, and when he was staring up at her, his eyes looked like shark eyes, and it legitimately gave me a chill up my spine. I was so so disappointed for every actress in this movie. All of these women deserve so much more respect than 80 for Brady was ever capable of giving them. This film embraces every old person movie cliche with a sort of desperate elation. Like it just can't wait to show you nothing new or of value. It's incredible how the screenwriters seem to have never even looked at weed before and then just decided to write it. And it feels like the movie was written by Mormons when it comes to just the general non-understanding of how marijuana makes people feel. This is a flat, ugly looking film. I understand that we are dealing with four women of a certain age and they all probably do not want to have certain features emphasized, but for the love of God, there has never been so few shadows in a film. And finally, we have arrived to the final movie. At number one is Meg 2, The Trench. I need to give another, you know, like preamble message. This is another film I did not finish. We stopped watching this movie at roughly 30 minutes in. Meg 2, The Trench is not a film that's worth seeing if it gets better because of how blatant and bluntly clear it is a film that is dead on arrival from the very start. I know that these movies are produced by a Chinese production company. The producers were clearly stuck on whom this film was going to be for, since they have characters switched between English and Mandarin every other sentence. The amount we saw was at least 50-50. In Meg 2, The Trench, there was no inspiration, there was no creativity, and there was no passion. To be honest, this is not a film. This is a product meant to be consumed, and that is it. It's a really troubling thing to see Ben Wheatley, one of the most promising filmmakers of the 2000s, to see him give up his self-respect and his unique imagination for the holy dollar. It's one of cinema's greatest losses. This is a film that emulates everything wrong with all modern blockbusters. The idea of, you know, get the asses in the seats by showing the most crazy stuff in the trailer and then force them to sit through cliche after cliche, praying that the popcorn, the candy, and the soda will fill the void of serotonin that this film was supposed to provide, and it did. Yeah, I know I sound really bitter when I talk about this movie. This film is a bitter pill of reality when it comes to the state of 
blockbusters. Meg to the Trench is a despicable waste of money. In a year where there was so much pushback on the concept of studios shelving movies forever for tax write-off, if there is ever a movie that deserved that, it's Meg to the Trench. Okay, I think I'm done. I want to thank you all for sitting through my worst films of 2023 video. I really appreciate it. If you liked what I had to say, you know, feel free to like the video, subscribe, watch my other reviews. I should also have a Kickstarter on here at this point for a documentary I hope to make this year upstate. So, I mean, I would love if you guys took a look at that too uh, and considered if this concept of this documentary strikes your fancy to, you know, just send me a dollar or something. That would be awesome. The next two videos will be a lot more lighthearted. I'll be talking more positively about cinema. I will be talking about why I love cinema, basically, which I feel like I really need to do after this. I, I'm sure by the end, when I go through, back through this in post, I'm going to be very worried about how negative I'm coming off, but I think it'll be fine. So more to come. See you later.